Hello there. Welcome back to my existential nightmare. I've got a wonderful new kit for you for y'all today. Um, fresh in the mail, just got it about 20 minutes ago, give or take. I don't know, something like that. Um, this is a new kit from Funny Playing. This is what they're calling the M2 kit. Um, they're calling that, they're calling it that for the same reason I refer to some of their older kits as 9380 kits or Q5 kits, uh, because this specific LCD is out of a Canon M2. Um, Hence the name M2. Um, but it is repurposed here for a Game Boy Advance SP backlight kit. Uh, so let's go ahead and take a look, see what we've got included. Um, of course, a card detailing that we want to test it before installing. Um, these things are pretty delicate. It's pretty easy to damage them. Um, yeah. <laughs> I was going to make a comment about how I throw stuff around, but really, the, there, there's like, I dropped that an inch, really. You, you can't tell because the camera is only one single viewpoint above me, but I'm, I'm, not, I'm not throwing it around that hard, really. Um, and if it breaks from that, it stands no chance in the actual Game Boy. Uh, but anyway, you know, you want to do a bench test, handle with care, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, RGRS in particular doesn't normally accept returns for kits that are fully installed if they're defective so you make sure you want to make sure you get all that testing done in advance but uh uh that's that's not what we're here for well i guess that is exactly what we're here for but for different reasons uh <laughs> anyway ignore me i'm just i'm i'm loopy it's been a long day um we've got a single wire for presumably uh, button controls with the brightness button on the SP. Uh, this is optional. We've got the adapter ribbon itself with a detachable ribbon. Um, this part connects up to the SP. I like that they offer it on a separate ribbon. I'm wondering if that's for... I'm wondering if this is because they use the exact same kit for Game Boy Advance. Let's find out because I have one of those too and, and we'll uh, I'll, I'll do a video on this at some point in the future I'm guessing it's because it's the exact same adapter and they just yeah that's exactly what I thought so it's the same adapter ribbon and then they just have the ribbon specific for the Game Boy that you're installing it in because the Game Boy Advance one comes with the 32 and the 40 pin and then the Game Boy Advance SP comes with the 34 pin. So that's just a cost saving measure on their part. Um, but it also means that if you damage the ribbon that goes in the hinge, uh, you don't have to throw out the whole kit and get a new one because you messed up. You could just get the cheap long ribbon and um, replace that. But I digress. As of this moment, those are not sold separately, so. Uh, that, that could change. It's also possible you could just contact the seller and uh, maybe get one that way. But anyway, moving on. You get the adapter ribbon. There is a touch sensor on here. Um, we'll be trying that out. There is also a pad down here for soldering the button control. Actually, it looks like there's two pads. Um, and that's pretty much it. It just attaches to the screen, gets hidden in the shell, and Bob Gianti. And then on the screen side, it is the Canon EOS M2 LCD that has been laminated to a custom Game Boy Advance SP lens. Um, pretty standard affair. Um, looks a lot like what they've been doing with a lot of their older kits. One thing I don't like is these tabs for the LCD are folded up. Uh, I sort of kind of see that here. Um, these are sharp. Be careful you don't cut yourself, there's three of them. I don't think you need to do anything with them. I'm pretty sure they're folded up and out of the way so that it actually fits when you install it, but do be careful. I'm gonna try and avoid cutting myself, but no promises. And then last but not least, we have a bracket. Uh, I'm not 100% sure what this bracket is for. I am fairly confident this bracket is for if you're installing it in a funny playing shell. Um, otherwise, I don't think you need the bracket. Uh, we will be testing both. I have an OEM shell here and a 
funny playing shell, oops, and a funny playing shell that we'll be doing the actual install in. Uh, I'm gonna be taking apart a Game Boy that I've already done an install in because, I mean, realistically, I have so many of these things and I never use them, so there's almost no point in me keeping them modded. But I always say this, or at least I um, don't say it so much in my videos, but I do say it so much in my written communications. I think the best backlight kit is the one that you already have. The difference between these kits is, for the most part, pretty minimal. Um, so in this particular case, I have an ITA modded Game Boy Advance SP. This thing works totally fine. I'm gonna replace this with a new kit and I'm gonna get more or less the exact same experience. Um, but I'm, I'm the exception, not the rule, okay? Um, because I make content with these things. So it makes sense for me. But if you're actually playing these things, you know, it makes a little bit less sense. Um, this funny playing shell in particular uses all cross-headed screws, so I don't have to get out the special Y. Oh my goodness, why are these sticking to my fingers? Um, but I have done plenty of videos on tearing down an SP before a stock SP. Um, if you're watching my video for instruction on installing this kit, then, uh, I'm sorry, this isn't going to be the best example, um, because I'm starting with a modded one, but I'll, I'll try and walk you through it. On a normal SP, these four corner screws are longer than these two screws right here, and they're all, um, tri-point, not tri-wing, there's a difference. Um, but it probably doesn't matter because if you search for it, you'll get the same thing anyway. <laughs> um, or Y screws. That's, that's what it's actually called on the bit itself. Um, Funny Playing's page for the shells documents this as well, so you know which screws go where. Uh, and then once we get into the motherboard area here, there are three more short screws that are cross-headed. These are from the factory. These are supposed to be JIS screws, not Phillips. There's a difference there too. Um, you can probably get away with a Phillips as long as you're using the correct size, but you'll have a much better experience with the JIS driver. And then once we've got those three out, we can hinge the motherboard up, and then we gotta release this ribbon cable. I'm gonna do it with my two thumbnails here. And on a stock SP, this is not soldered. But on my SP, it is, because modded. Um, I forgot to turn on my soldering iron, so I'll do that right now. I gotta get this detached before I can disassemble further. Alright. Desolder that there. And I'm gonna take it off the ribbon just to reduce my likelihood of destroying a perfectly working kit. I will be reusing these buttons and membranes and speaker, speaker especially because zero benefit to replacing them. Buttons and membranes, because they're already basically brand new anyway. Uh, same thing with the shell, and then once we've got that out, there is one more long cross-headed screw This is the only long one on the inside. Keep that in mind, um, at least on this side. Uh, you can use long screws here, but I believe from the factory they're short. Uh, and then this hinge piece comes right out. And then you can pull the ribbon out. Though it might make more sense to leave that there until you've got this more disassembled. Um, anyway, we'll continue disassembly in a moment. Let's go ahead and start testing because if this doesn't work, there's no point in going any further anyhow. Uh, let's get a baseline with a stock screen um, just so we can do some power usage testing and get some reliable numbers. Uh, I'm going to use the same game that 
I almost always test with. It's my legitimate copy of Pokemon Emerald here. Uh, and get the power supply. And we will set this to three point seven volts. And I need to double check which one is which. Because they don't label the board. Why would they? Those jerks. Okay. Should be good. Turn that on. And of course, I'm using a power supply, but there's zero reason you can't just drop this back into the shell and then use your battery. Uh, why aren't you on? There we go. And it is a front lit screen and the light is on. It's just, it's what the stock screens look like in these things. All right, so in the overworld, um, in Moss Deep City, I don't remember if that's where I usually test, but it is now, uh, at 3.7 volts, the console is pulling 56 to 59 milliamps, which is about what I expect, or basically 0.2 watts. Um, I like the milliamp number better, even though watts is technically more informative. I'm just used to milliamps. At this point, it makes a little sense to change. You can do the math when you know the voltage. Um, it's just volts times amps. That's how you get watts. Uh, but do keep in mind that uh, 1,000 milliamps is an amp. So this is shown as 0 0.057, which is 57 milliamps. Uh, but yeah, that's about what we expect. That should be good. Let's try the new one. Uh... How does this go? I'm actually unfamiliar with this. <sighs> Good thing I thought ahead and got pictures. So this goes like that. And then we can plug it in. Oh, it's backwards. Just like that, and everything should just work. Hey! Exact same game, exact same place, default settings on this kit, 3.7 volts still. Console is pulling 162 to 165 milliamps. So quite a bit more, but not terrible. Uh, and then quick press of the touch sensor, adjust the brightness at the lowest brightness. This thing is pulling 109 to 113 milliamps. And then we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 levels of brightness, I think. I think it's 15. Uh, 202 to 207 milliamps. Yeah. And then back down again. So you'll double the power usage between low brightness and high brightness, but I don't know how well you can see that. I can't see it very well at all. I can see it well enough to see that the screen's on, but I would never use it at this brightness. That's just too dark. I think right about there is the most reasonable value, uh, and that's about 142 to 145 milliamps. Um, but it's working. We'll go through all the features later. Um, all we really needed to make sure was that the screen is working. Uh, I'd recommend at this point giving it a once over on the LCD itself, or even several once overs. Make sure that there's no damaged or stuck pixels. Um, I'm not going to do that right now because that's kind of... That's, it's it's going to take a few minutes and this video is already going to be long enough. So 
yeah. But I'd recommend you do that because last time I did a video on a backlight kit, the screen was damaged and I did not catch it and I installed it anyway. Um, that was that Q5 from one chip and I'm butthurt about it, but I've also got about a million laminated Q5 LCDs, so it's really not a big deal whatsoever. Um, but if I didn't, that would have been a bit of a bummer. Anyway, uh, CPU AGBB, I guess this is revision one, AGS CPU one, yeah. Okay, just for my notes, old board. Uh, and then I guess we can fold that that way, or we can fold it under. Under probably doesn't make sense, because then that gets those ribbons overlap in a weird way. Uh, I don't know. What does Funny Plane say to do? Let's see. They don't say to do anything, because they don't have instructions for this yet. Okie dokie. They just have a picture. A single picture of this bracket. Alright. So it pins down on the LCD connector, pins up on the other connector. I just cut my nails and I cannot get that. Good. Excellent. All right, and then this bracket goes on with the, the funny loose part up near the top. And in this orientation, Uh, and then the tabs, I guess, are supposed to locate the bracket. Uh, it doesn't really stick to the screen in any meaningful way. I'm guessing the casing is what holds it together. Uh, we'll, we'll get that. I'm just going to remove this. Ooh, shiny. Okay. Let's continue disassembly. Turn my soldering iron off. All right. I have yet to remove any of these on a funny playing shell. Let's see how this goes. They are a lot tighter than OEM ones. I feel like I'm gonna ruin them. And they're adhered. What if I use two of them? orange one to pull it back, and then the nice sharp black one, get it in between there, alright, alright, that's not terrible, but yeah, I really don't like that. I guess don't install these things until you know you're not taking your Game Boy apart again. Come on. Highly recommend using plastic tools for this, not metal. Um, it is exceptionally easy to mar up the shell or the the little silicone thing. Oh, no, where'd it go? Oh, there it is. <laughs> Let's 
transparent. I couldn't find it. All right. And then there are five more crosshead screws on an OEM Game Boy Advance SP. Um, oh, they're all short, by the way, not long. Um, on an OEM Game Boy Advance SP, on an AGS-001, these are all the Y screwdrivers, or the tri-point. On an AGS-101, however, I've only ever seen them cross-headed, which is a little weird, but sure. All right. Set that aside, save it for rainy day or something, I don't know. All right. This thing, I'll do a test fit here, I believe. And just drop that in. It doesn't really seem snug. But yeah, that's exactly what that bracket is for, to hold it into this shell. Without this bracket, Oh yeah, without this bracket, it just kind of sinks in and there's a big gap, at least on the bottom. On the top, it seems nice and secure. All right, so definitely use the bracket if you've got a funny playing shell. Let's test an OEM shell. I expect it just fits with no bracket necessary. In fact, the bracket probably doesn't fit at all. Yeah, that just slots right in there. This. It's on there. And yep, no bracket necessary. So there you go. If you're using OEM shell, oop, no bracket needed. Uh, and real quick while we're here, I imagine a not insignificant amount of you are reshelling your Game Boy. Um, perhaps using one of Funny Playing's nice clear shells. I like them. I think they're cool. Um, the Funny Playing shells don't have a frosted texture on them, so they're super transparent, uh, whereas the OEM shells do, and a lot of the other aftermarket ones also have frosted texture. I think Cloud Game Store just started making shells, and I don't think they're frosted either. But I don't, I don't have one handy to... I mean, I do have one somewhere, but it's unlabeled and I've forgotten which it is. Uh, but anyway, point of that uh, is you're going to need to extract your hinges from the original shell. I made a tool that should make that a little bit easier. I'll link it in the description. You just 3D print it or order like a dozen of them 3D printed from like JLC PCB. It's just a couple bucks for all of them. Uh, but you open the shell up. Put the tool in and then just push and sometimes they're really tight this is one of those times Ugh. and usually they don't just fucking launch but this one did um do keep in mind they are directional this one is the right side hinge and then the left side we can crack it loose with it closed but we really shouldn't um, but unfortunately, my tool kind of only works with it closed on this side. Ugh. And you just press on that until it clicks. I'm not having a good time right now, and I don't want to force it. Um, and then you can open it up and then stick like a screwdriver in there to send it the rest of the way. I'm not going to do it right now. Um, I'll, I'll link the tool in the description if you want to check it out. Um, oh, and then you just slide your caps off. Oh, that one destroyed itself. Um, and then slide on the replacements. Funny playing shells in particular, I believe they require OEM hinges. 
Um, I'd recommend using OEM hinges anyway. The aftermarket ones kind of suck. Uh, there is a new manufacturer for them. I have not tried them yet, but given that they're from a store that has a history of issues, I'm probably not going to try them anytime soon. Uh, and then it installs reverse of removal, make sure it's open, slide it home, and then Bob Jaunty. All right, I'm going to put this away. Hopefully that was helpful enough. Um, I do have plenty of other videos on this subject. I even have a dedicated video just for those hinge removal tools. Uh, but anyway, moving on. Let's get this install done. Let's get this wrapped up. Already 25 minutes in and I have a pile of parts on my desk still. I guess that goes there. Um, let's do that before installing the bracket. I don't normally care for touch sensors, but there's zero reason we shouldn't test them. What am I doing? I do this every single time. I don't know why. cannot get this tape off. Why do you do this to me? There we go. Oh, and there's tape here too. I'm thinking we'll fold the ribbon underneath the adapter board. That way we can just stick it down and it should be fine right there. And this goes this way. lining this up there's a little hole on this side right here not on this side this side has a much much larger hole um, little hole right here that's where that tab goes And I just wanted to make sure that this wasn't going to get in the way of that. I didn't want to stick that down and then find out it's not aligned. Oh, I'm doing this in the wrong order. I forgot to give this a twist. And because we're threading into plastic here, this does not need to be, you don't need to use your whole cans to, to tighten these down. Just snug them up and then back a quarter turn. And um, your screw posts will thank you for that, trust me.
good. Let's reinstall the hinge cover. That was five short screws in the screen, one long screw in the hinge cover. If you're using OEM, um, this is supposed to be cross-headed on the inside. And then these five are tri-point if you're using AGS 101 or 001 as a donor or cross-headed, or JIS rather, if you're using a 101 as a donor. Um, I think that's it. Oh, let's do, yeah. Let's wire up the button controls, might as well. Let's see if I can get these buttons in here in the meantime. inside of this shell absolutely littered with fingerprints. It's gonna be wonderfully annoying. But at this point, do you really expect anything different from me? This one's for you, Marshall. Ah, uh, speaker. I don't recommend doing this soldering in the shell, but I didn't think about this ahead of time, and here we are. That is too high. How about just the light? There we go. Tin this up. If you're gonna be naughty like me and solder in the shell, be extra special careful that you do not touch the sides. It's like a game of operation, except failure means you destroy your shell. Additionally, you really don't wanna get solder on those pins. Uh, that is a great way to destroy your kit. I suppose, actually, it is easier to solder it before I install it. So let's do that. The solder point, if you are doing the soldering, which again is optional, is right here. It is labeled Q12B. Get that tinned up. And that's it. One wire, easy peasy. Then drop that in. And make sure your wire is not doing what mine is. Generally, you want to route this this way and then around the button over top. So let me fix that. There we go, like that. And that's not just for aesthetic reasons, you just don't want it getting in the way of any of the membranes or any of the pinch points in the shell because that's how you crack the shell. And that's how you get really unresponsive buttons. All right, now it's three short screws. Be very careful not to over tighten these. In fact, probably don't even bottom them out. Uh, if you've got a clear shell, you are at an advantage here because once you've got them installed, you can just open it up and look and see how far the screw is from hitting the edge or the, the bottom of the screw post. And then slowly finish tightening them until they're either snug or touching the bottom of the screw post. And what do we have left? Not much. Make 
Make sure your power switch is in there and aligned with the actual power switch. Great way to break the part otherwise. Four long screws in the corners. one doesn't feel right. No, it's definitely seated. I think we're good. It just feels weird. And then short screw in the battery compartment. That one you can send as tight as you want, but of course if you tighten it too much it's going to strip. So snug and then back a quarter turn. And then this one in the cart slot is also short screw, but same deal with the motherboard screws. Just be very careful because in some cases the screw post is just a little bit shorter than it should be uh, or a little bit shallower than it should be or the screw itself is just a little bit longer than it should be or heaven forbid both and that's how you get an, an ugly nipple on your shell but I'm good we're good this is fine everything is fine um, I don't recommend these batteries by the way but I happen to have one, so I'm using it. And before you ask what battery I do recommend, um, let me just say I have a battery with my name on it for a reason. Uh, but the funny playing one is also pretty good. <laughs> oh, that was weird. It's fine now. <laughs> Something wasn't seated properly. But, uh, yeah, so far so good. Uh, just short press of the brightness button cycles through the brightness settings. I just went through that like three times without counting. I'm pretty sure we still, we have the same 15 levels. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, and then back to zero. And then I'm pretty sure a, actually, I have no idea if a medium press does anything. Let's find out. Oh, yeah, it just goes down. Probably the same with the touch sensor. Yep. I'm guessing the touch sensor button maps are the exact same as the brightness button because you, you've just got one input either way. And then a long press should bring us into the OSD. That's annoying though, because it always does a short press before it does the long press. So your brightness always goes down one step just getting into the OSD. Uh, but then hit the button again to cycle through whatever option you have selected or the touch sensor to cycle through whatever option you have selected. And then I believe a medium press will get us over to the next option. And uh, we'll go over all these in just a moment. Let me set that back there. And let's get, I don't know what that is yet. We'll have to figure that out. CG, uh, where is my flashcard? Oh, here it is. Almost like I planned ahead. All right, let's go through some basic tests first. I'm gonna use the Game Boy Color tests that I usually use. Uh, I think it's been over a year since I last charged this thing, so I'm just gonna plug it in right now to be safe. <laughs> uh, let's do GB test realms. Uh, let's start with the simple stuff. How about Matt Curie? Scrolling bars with reset. So this is a real simple test. I haven't seen this be a problem in years at this point. 
Uh, but what this is doing is every time the S in the word scrolling is going off the left hand side of the screen, the Game Boy is issuing a LCD reset command to the LCD. Um, uh oh, I can't tell which ones are the thick ones. I think those are the thick ones. Um, and what that means is, so screens are typically drawn line by line, uh, row by row. Uh, so the pixels will be drawn from the top left all the way over a whole row, and then it'll go down to the next line and start over again on the left-hand side, and the next line down again until you get all the way to the bottom of the screen. In this case, there's like 160 rows, um, and it's doing basically a frame, uh, 60 frames a second, so it's going real fast. An LCD reset command tells the LCD to stop whatever you're doing, wherever you are, and then start on the next frame immediately. So if you're, you know, say about here-ish down, it's gonna just throw out the rest of the data and then start back up here at the top. Um, it's really not that big of a deal. Uh, when you think about it, we're talking about fractions of a second, but it makes a difference. Um, a lot of, not a lot of, some older games relied on that to try and increase the responsiveness of the LCD itself, notably Pokemon Pinball. Um, in this particular case, though, it's just, it, it, it's doing exactly what it's supposed to. It's throwing out the rest of the frame and then just starting on the next one, and we're good to go. Older kits would have um, some pretty significant screen tearing, or maybe they'll just, like, lock up for a few seconds at a time. And, you know, if you're playing Pokemon Pinball, that makes the game damn near unplayable. But in this particular case, zero issues. Everything's good. Let's reset. Let's go into... Um, I don't think I need anything else from here. I'm gonna dump or drop in... Oh, I did need something else. But it's not on my flash card. I have dedicated the card for it. Zass. We're gonna talk about the FRM feature before going over the rest of the features. The, everything else I'll do from a GBA cart. So this game is unique in that the entire background of this game is made up of transparent sprites. Now, uh, the original Game Boy console, or well, I think all Game Boy consoles for that matter, do not support transparency in hardware. However, the original screens had such horrendous pixel response times, devs were able to take advantage of the poor response times and implement a pseudo-transparency by just flickering sprites on and off. Um, so if you do that at 60 hertz, um, it results in a nice transparency effect. However, these modern screens are much better, much faster, and instead of giving you that nice transparency effect that the devs intended, you just get flickering. Now, in this particular case, it's working really well. There's no flickering, everything looks good. But we're gonna go into the OSD here. I said, we're gonna go into the OSD here. Oh, why aren't you working? That's super weird. Oh, and FRM was off. Oh, the label's backwards. Okay, so now FRM is on, but I can see visually that it's actually off. Um, so now I'm getting quite a bit of flicker on here. This is what this game looks like. Um, hopefully it's coming through on camera. I don't see it coming through whatsoever in the preview, but I see it pretty flickery in person. Um, it's not great. That being said, this specific screen is one of the least severe offenders, I guess. Um, even with this flickering, I think this is totally playable. It's a little distracting, but it's totally playable. Um, whereas if we turn that back on, can I do it? No. We'll try it from the touch sensor. Uh, and now we'll turn FRM off, but really we're just turning it back on. Um, 
and close this. And now my flicker has gone away. So what this is doing in hardware is it's effectively averaging the two um, adjacent frames together. So in theory, this does result in a little bit of extra latency because this screen cannot display the current frame until it gets the data for the next frame after it. Um, in practice, it's entirely possible that the kit was doing that regardless of whether you had the feature on or not. Um, I have not measured this. I don't know, but either way, I can't tell the difference uh, in terms of uh, input latency. I can't tell the difference between FRM on and off. Uh, in this specific game, I can tell uh, because the background does stop flickering quite severely. Uh, but with that being said, let me switch to the flash cart, the GBA flash cart, and I bet this works now. Yep, go figure. That's interesting. Close, please. There it goes. Uh, and let's go into a Pokemans game. And this was probably a bad example because I don't think I have running shoes. Let's, you know what? I have my Pokemon game right here. We'll just use that. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm crazy. Go into the overworld here. Uh, because FRM is still on, um, it says off in the OSD, but it's actually on. In the overworld, you can run around. Everything looks fine. It's really not that big of an issue. Um, in fact, it looks quite reminiscent of how the original hardware would have displayed this game, aside from being backlit, of course. Uh, but if we go into the OSD here and turn FRM off, close that out, you might notice things look a little bit smoother. There's no more blurring when running around. Like, I'm not looking at the player character, but I'm looking at the scenery in the background as I'm moving around. It's nice and sharp and in focus the whole time with FRM off. Um, and I'll turn that back on just for comparison. Well. And it's still fine. It's still totally playable. It's one of those things that unless someone points it out to you or you're looking for it, you'd probably never notice it. But it is blurrier. So, that being said, I'd recommend keeping it off unless you're playing a game and you're noticing quite a lot of flickering. Uh, so, and it looks like the OSD is bugged and the label is backwards. So on is off and off is on. So now my OSD says it's on, but it's actually off. And that's, I think, where I'm going to keep it. Okay, next, let's talk through the rest of these options. Of course, you know what BRT is. That's brightness. Uh, CLR is color. So I believe we've got color filters. Um... So one is normal, it's one-to-one -one translation, the Game Boy sends an RGB value, the screen displays the RGB value, everybody happy. Oh. <laughs> Got it off just a little bit. This option, color two, looks to up the, the contrast a little. I'm not exactly sure what it's doing. I don't dislike it. Um, it might be a good way to make the screen a little bit more viewable at lower brightness levels. Um, in fact, oop. yeah, I can see that. I don't know. I just pulled that out of my ass, but it seems reasonable. Um, I don't know. I'm into it. Uh, Three looks to do the exact opposite, whereas it is going to desaturate the colors a little bit. Um, you might have to turn up the brightness as a method of compensation, but I don't know. In this case, it, it kind of just looks a little washed out. 
I don't know. Let's do... Now let's do the flash drive so I can get 240p test suite and I'll pull up the color bars and you can you can have a look see at that yourself. So there are your color bars. Uh, one thing I noticed in one chip's implementation of a similar feature is that when you enable it, you lose some color bit depth. Uh, but here I can still see that each section, you know, individually is a different color. Uh, so it looks like we're not having that same experience here. Ooh, is it not working? Funny playing, man. <sighs> they should have put a little bit more time in testing this. I'll tell you that much. Um, okay, so there's your default. Oh, actually, we are losing bit depth. I didn't realize that. So you can see there's quite a few more divisions between the colors um, in one and two versus three. We're losing some depth there. Uh, also, black becomes dark gray. I don't know about that. Um, option four is, of course, just grayscale. And then option five is green scale, <laughs> uh, like DMG. Mm, I, don't, I don't know. I don't think this is it, Chief. I'm gonna leave mine on one for now. Uh, DSP, uh, that looks to enable pixel grid modes. Uh, oh, that's weird. Okay, so option one, I'll of course try and take some microscope pictures of this later, um, post imager album in the description. I'll, while I'm at it, I'll do the other kit that I totally forgot to do. Um, DSP-1 looks to be integer scaling, one-to-one. -one. Uh, this specific screen, I believe, is 720 by 480, which is giving us a 3x integer scale over the original GBA. Um, but display option two looks to soften the image a little bit. So maybe if you had one of their older V3 kits, as people keep referring to it, it's actually just 3.0 inch. Um, this bad boy with the non-integer scaling, if you're used to the, the sort of soft look of this, maybe that's for emulating that. And I don't know, I'm not really feeling it though. I think I prefer the sharper image of number one. And then number three looks to be option number one, but with horizontal, um, black lines being inserted. Uh, there's no vertical lines, just horizontal ones as a pixel grid emulation feature. It's weird that they didn't include the vertical lines. Interesting. And then CG, oops, CG. Ah, you know what? This might be the feature I was mistaking color for. Because number one, oh, you know what? Let me turn the display mode back. Oops. This is not the most intuitive navigation, but I suppose once you've got this set how you like it, you're probably going to leave it. Yeah, it looks like by default it's almost desaturated, and then you turn up the saturation a little. And there's three steps, zero, or one, two, and three and we're not losing any color bit depth with any of these options. We, we've got everything the whole time. I wanna put it back in game, because I'm just, I've played this Pokemon game so many times that I intuitively know how it should look, or rather, I intuitively know when something doesn't look right, <laughs> usually. Of course, I'm saying that and I, didn't notice any issues earlier, so. Let's see, does it work now? Yeah, of course it does. So 
So I guess it does look kind of soft, and then, yeah, that's interesting. I don't know, I honestly don't know how it's supposed to look. I jinxed myself. I don't know. I, I honestly think I'd just have to sit here and play with it. I kind of like option number three. I think that's... I think that's how these kits normally look. You know what? This one doesn't have any weird color. Let me just boot up this game and we'll put it side by side. Uh... Please be the same save. That is not the same save, but it's close enough. Okay, let's turn off pixel grid mode. Yeah, okay, so number one is how these things normally look. And I don't know, I can't tell you what it's doing to the colors, but it's doing something. Everything looks a little bit lighter, and I kind of like it. I'm leaning towards option three is my favorite option for this. I think this is about how I would use this kit. And yeah, having them side by side, I really like the, the sharpness of the new kit over the kind of soft edges, blurry of the older kit. Hmm, very interesting. All right, I think that's about it. I don't know if I have much else to talk about for this thing. Um, I guess let's finish off with Super Mario World, um, that's the best latency test those we can get right now, or that I can get. Oh, see, the colors look super weird now. And look at that. I can't get into the menu, it's just cycling through colors. Set that back to one. That looks better in this game. What a super weird save. Who takes this path? All right, I want this level and I want Mario. Oh, I messed up. Oh, I messed up again. Uh, so right now, the reason I'm playing this, aside from the fact that I just like this game, uh, I am using this as a attempt at testing the input lag. Um, the theory is this game is a little bit more sensitive to properly timed inputs, unlike a game like Pokemon. Uh, so if the inputs are kind of funny, it's a little bit more noticeable, but Feels fine to me. I'm having no issues aside from uh, skill-based ones. A uh, couple more games, why not? We're already here. Uh, 
Oh, I should put a new battery in this at some point. I'm gonna guess my brightness button is not working right now. Yep, it's not working right now. I don't know what that's about, but it just doesn't seem to work in Game Boy Color mode. to ask funny playing what these specific options are supposed to do because I don't fully understand why there's two different options that tweak color and I think it's a little silly that it, it feels like they left out a display mode option because they have a 3x integer scale so they could have done vertical pixel grid as well and the fact that they didn't just feels a little off I don't know Weird. Yeah, I think this is about all I got. I'm gonna, I'm gonna end the video right about here-ish. Um, so thanks to Retro Game Repair Shop for shooting this kit my way to check out. Uh, unfortunately, in its current state, I really can't recommend it. Um, I'm gonna guess that the OSD can get fixed pretty easily with a firmware update, um, but the brightness button issues, again, it's not working. I don't know what that's about. I bet as soon as we get in game though, let me fire up this thing. And I bet now it works. Yep. Oh, but now I can't exit. Oh, here we go. It could just be my specific Game Boy, but I really don't think it is because it was working fine with the old kit. I mean, you, you saw me rip out the ITA kit. Oh, we missed him. Oh no, let's go talk to Professor Birch. Oh, I do have running shoes. It's weird that you start with them. I don't know, this is a nice looking ROM hack that I kind of wanted to play through, but obviously I'm not gonna do that in this video. But yeah, there we go. Um, yeah, I will throw some links to this stuff in the description. I will also update the description um, as far as when this kit gets fixed, because I'm sure Funny Playing will fix these issues. Uh, but it's not exactly the easiest to update the video. I have to shoot new video, edit, and then upload a new video. Um, can't, can't really edit. I, I think YouTube was playing around with offering that kind of functionality but only to certain uploaders, and I am not one of them. <laughs> so here we are. Again, thanks to Retro Game Repair Shop for sending this my way. Um, I'm going to try and check out the Game Boy Advance version of this kit as well. Hopefully it doesn't have the same bugs, but I'm not very confident that... Uh, not very confident that that kit's going to work any better. Um, but as soon as Funny Playing gets this stuff figured out, I think... I think this will be a pretty good kit. It's relatively decent on power usage. Um, I don't know why I keep using the spudger. I can just use my finger. And it's not working again. So once Funny Playing gets that working, unless you just don't care about button controls, in which case, fine, the touch sensor seems fine. Brightness is fine, color is fine, I just don't know exactly what it's doing. Uh, DSP is also fine, but I feel like they're missing a mode. FRM, the label is reversed, and then CG, 
also I think is fine. I just don't know exactly what that's doing either. I'll try and update the description. Um, but those are minor issues. It's really not gonna affect the kit. Um, and like I said, this is one of those things you kinda, once you got it set up, it's fine. You don't really mess with it that often. Uh, I can see why you might wanna use your brightness button though. I think that's an actual problem. Um, yeah, I'm not gonna mess with it too much. I gotta go. Um, thanks for watching. Uh, check the description for updates and links to some other stuff. I'll, I'll link to where you can grab one of these kits if you want. Uh, Retro Game Repair Shop will probably be carrying them, though as of this moment in time, they are not yet listed. Um, and since this video is probably going up today, hey, what do you know? Um, there won't be a link. I'll, I'll throw a link to Funny Planks kit. Uh, but like I said, probably hold off until it's fixed. I will update the description at that point and you know, I'll throw links to some of this stuff if you want to check it out. Um, in the meantime, thanks for watching. Um, thanks for sticking with me this, this long. It's been a long, crazy journey and um, looking forward to, to, to many more, as it were. Um, bye.